Tony Speaks and this is my lovely wife, Kim. We are the founders and co-creators of the lifestyle brand and podcast, Becoming Disciplined. Every week we meet, learn from, and share best practices with highly disciplined men and women from a variety of fields and endeavors. Follow us on our journey. Bishop Teresa Jefferson Snorton is the 59th bishop and the first female bishop in the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church since its founding in 1870. She is presiding bishop of the 5th Episcopal District, which includes the states of Alabama and Florida. Bishop Jefferson Snorton is the founder of the Empowerment Conference, the Phenomenal Woman Summit, and an advocate for healthy communities and healthy churches. Bishop Snorton has multiple degrees and certificates culminating with a Doctor of Ministry degree from United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. Bishop Jefferson Snorton is a board certified chaplain with the Association of Professional Chaplains. She is also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Bishop Jefferson Snorton, a native of Kentucky, is married to Reverend Lawrence Jefferson Snorton and is the mother of two adult sons and two grandchildren. But this week, Bishop Jefferson Snorton is becoming disciplined. Today on Becoming Discipline, we interview Bishop Teresa Jefferson Snorton. Bishop Snorton, welcome to Becoming Discipline. We are so honored to have you. Thank you. What a delight to be here with you today. Amen. Amen. Now, Bishop Snorton, before you educate us and share your current status and, and what your organization is doing, I think it's good for my audience to be aware of context. We know as in, if we're going to understand scripture correctly, context is king. Uh, what is the begin? What is your origin story? What is the beginning to your story? Oh, my. Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> oh, as much time as you want, ma'am. <laughs> well, I'm a native of the state of Kentucky. Uh, I was born in a town uh, called Hopkinsville in the western part of the state. Uh, my parents were young. My mother was uh, just barely out of high school and my father was uh, first year college. And, um, you know, they were kind of struggling parents uh, who, with the help of their um, extended family, um, decided to get married and try to raise this baby that God gave them. Um, I, I lived in Hopkinsville most of my life. I briefly lived in New York uh, as a very young child, pre preschooler, um, but grew up there in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, went to public schools, uh, grew up in Lane Tabernacle CME Church. And um, <laughs> my father was, first he was a lay pastor and then he became an ordained minister. So um, church was real central uh, to our lives. And that's kind of how things got started. I consider myself a small town girl, a southerner, um, and uh, definitely the product of the generation that switched from segregation to integration. Mm -hmm. I remember vividly, uh, I'll say in my years before I was 10, going to segregated schools, having to um, sit in the balcony at the movies, uh, seeing those fountains that said colored and white. And um, there were stores that we could not uh, go in and shop. And uh, one of my uh, memories about segregation was not being able to eat at the lunch counter in the um, local drugstore. Mm. So um, I, I'm in that generation that saw a whole lot of change. Uh, and, and that that's pretty significant for me right now at this uh, stage of my life as we see, I guess, kind of the resurgence of some of the um, uh, isms that were very common during my childhood. No, I have a question. That I, I have an off script question already. All right. Um, <laughs> my uh, my my context is, you know, the African-American Baptist Church. And uh, I was surprised when I was a young minister where I would run into some of the older deacons where they said one of the biggest mistakes that ever happened was the integration that, that, um, and this, you know, this was from an African-American context. And, and then as I began to study, I, I remember one time, uh, Dr. King said, uh, you know, he, and I'm paraphrasing Dr. King said, I fear that we've integrated into a house that's, that's on fire. Mm. Um, you know, he said something similar to that. 
Uh, and then there was there's also I did a little bit of study where a lot of African American teachers, when integration occurred, lost their jobs because they had you know there was the African American schools that were separate, and then the school system didn't integrate the teachers when they integrated the students. So there were a lot of uh, African American teachers who were left. Uh, uh, what's the name of that that game where you are don't have a chair to sit? Uh, uh, mm-hmm. um, um, you know. <laughs> we all we know what we're talking about. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So I wanted to hear from you since you mentioned that. Um, now with you know now having the chance to look back at it, was it a net positive, a net negative? What what are your thoughts when you hear people say things like that? Well, I think the uh, the initial impact was probably a net positive. Um, suddenly, uh, there was a true effort to make things equal. Um, but the reality is when, when one, um, party's already like, like literally miles ahead or years ahead, Mm -hmm. you know, equality is not the answer, uh, equity is. So I think in the long term, uh, we probably lost, um, if not in terms of quantity, in terms of quality. Mm -hmm. And I say that in terms of, um, you know, as a person who grew up in the church and, and watching the church kind of be the center of the community, that's almost absent now. Uh, it's it's a rare uh, community where the church is viewed as the center. And we've gotten uh, to the place where we have so many other activities and commitments that siphon off our time and really have... Um, I guess in some ways, if they haven't destroyed the village, they've at least scattered the village. Mm. And and this scattered village becomes real apparent. Um, I can't remember where I was just a few days ago, but I was somewhere and a woman had her child with her. And I wondered why she had this very young child in this particular place, because it really wasn't a place conducive uh, for a child to feel comfortable. And of course, she was trying to keep him quiet and, and, you know, it, kind of occurred to me she probably had nobody to take care of the kid while she mm. took care of business because okay. the village is scattered that used to be you know that that was not common in our day we had aunts and uncles all up and down the street <laughs> and across <laughs> town <laughs> and, and sometimes you really lost track of who really was related and who wasn't mm. so uh with this notion um of uh you know the way in which we have, quote, integrated into mainline culture means we had to uh, destroy uh, some of the key um, key things that kept us together as a community and really allowed us to thrive. We thrive because I think because of community, because we shared and um, no one did without. And mm-hmm. with that loss, now all of our expectations have turned to uh, governmental agencies and o- other organizations to fill that gap, and the politics just aren't inclined to do so. Mm. Now, um, you you beg my next question, which is beautiful. You you set it up for me, Bishop. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Without <laughs> even knowing it. That's right. That's right. Uh, speaking about that community that you had when you were growing up, what was your uh, what was someone in your community, and also who was someone in your family that inspired you with their level of discipline? Um, I would probably say, uh, in my community would be my first grade teacher who also was my Sunday school teacher. And it's really interesting. We also shared a birthday, her birthday and my birthday were the same day, but Miss Augusta Crutchfield, uh, really, I think starting from first grade began to cultivate, um, without me really understanding it, the notion of discipline. Uh, her classroom was a very warm and inviting place, but it was also very orderly. And as students, there were expectations upon us in terms of um, putting things back and how we handled our papers and our pencils. And and she really cultivated that. And um, uh, so I would really say that. And then in my family, probably my father and I, I talk about my father being a strict disciplinarian. Um, you know, he just didn't, he, he, he was a hard worker. He loved to work. He was a workaholic. Uh, and he expected us to be, be the same, even as children. And, uh, I know as a child, teenager, young adult, I didn't really appreciate it, 
But I do think that a lot of the ways in which um, I understand and value um, what's necessary to get something done was probably cultivated through those experiences. That's beautiful. That is wonderful. Now, I want to let my audience know that uh, while you're, you're a person of, uh, of, of renown and you have a, you're in charge of a large organization uh, and, and you, know, you have a, a very prestigious title and everything, that's not even why I invited you on the show. I invited you know, because we all know from, the, from a recent president, you can, you can have a big title and still be a very undisciplined person, you know? <laughs> but uh, the reason why I invited you on the show is because one of your mentees several years ago was online and he was going on and on and on about his mentor who was, and he, and he wrote the blog post. It was the gospel of productivity, the gospel <laughs> of productivity. And he, I mean, he, he did several posts on your, uh, your productivity and your o organizational skills. His name was Anderson Graves. So mm -hmm. I want my audience to know that's why I brought you on, you know, that it, it was the it was the substance of 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 that post and 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 his testimony about your skills. Um, my question to you is, were you always organized or did you have a transformational experience experience that that turned you into an organized person? I think to a great extent, I've always been organized. Um, I think um, as I have matured. I have come to value uh, organization more and also come to come to a deeper appreciation for what's really important and what's what can wait. Uh, I can remember a period of time where everything felt urgent and necessary. And um, one way I coped with that was procrastination or or perfectionism. Mm -hmm. And um, neither one of those are comfortable places to live. You can't put off stuff and get things done. So, and you also can't do everything perfectly. So what? So part of my own maturation um, in, in my work, uh, both as chaplain, as a uh, clinical pastor educator, and now as bishop, was to kind of find that, that middle ground, that, that, that place where productivity is possible without without literally killing yourself uh, mm -hmm. because demands are, are great um, both in my job and in a lot of people's work and their lives. Because in addition to being, um, you know, all those work titles, I'm also a wife, a mother, a grandmother, uh, a daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, and, and I have some friends too. So Amen. there are all kinds of um, demands for your time and attention. And if you're not organized, but I, I think to a great extent, my goal was always to be organized. I probably have just learned to do it better without having to use um, strategies that really were not helpful. Mm, okay. All righty. Now, here on this show, we time travel. We we do what was only done in the Bible once. Where we, we, we're going to alter time here just for a moment. Okay. okay. And uh, <laughs> we're going to go and time travel to you, to, 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 Teresa uh, Jefferson Snorton at age 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And you get to time travel and whisper into her ear one sentence of, of a warning or one sentence of an admonition or one sentence of encouragement. What do you tell uh, uh, young uh, Miss Jefferson Snorton at that time? I can only tell her one thing. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm going to try to put this into one sentence. <laughs> uh, don't sweat the small stuff because your big dreams are important and you don't have to please the world <laughs> amen that's beautiful that's beautiful I can take that advice as well amen now uh, why did you choose the seminary that you chose well I've been to several seminaries um, I did my master of divinity degree at Louisville Presbyterian Okay. Uh, church uh, uh, seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and I went there primarily uh, convenience. Um, I decided fairly uh, late in the summer that I would go to seminary after uh, trying uh, my hand at teaching school and realizing that wasn't my calling. Uh, so it was 
easy to get to. They had a great scholarship program. And I was also really intrigued because they uh, that particular seminary had a real emphasis on field education. Mm. So for someone who had grown up in the church and had I'd, I'd been in the ministry then about three years, I really wasn't interested in just going and sitting in a classroom. Uh, then I went over to uh, Southern Baptist Seminary, started out in a Ph.D. program, but ended up just converting that to a master in theology. And that was a particularly and definitely for the uh, uh, psychology of religion program. That was really uh, my interest there. And they had a great program. And then I did my doctor of ministry at United Theological Seminary. And again, um, I don't want to say that's convenience because that was all the way in Dayton, but their, um, the structure of that program fit well with what I was doing professionally at the time. Uh, they use an intensive model and then, you know, the periodic meetings of your, your peer group in between. And of course, as a person who was fully employed and I had uh, pre-teenage children at the time, that was really um, a structure that, that met my needs. So I, I like to say, you know, I'm a Methodist who went to a Presbyterian seminary and a Baptist seminary and a United Methodist seminary. I'm truly ecumenically trained. Okay. Amen. Amen. When and how did you know that you were called to serve the Lord in a greater capacity? Oh, wow. Um, well, actually, my call story begins in um, the summer after I graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. uh, our denomination had an evangelism program at Payne College under the leadership of um, General Secretary Nathaniel Lindsay, who later became bishop. And uh, it was in that experience of really being taught how to share faith, because I went to church, you know, we were in church all the time, <laughs> but that was an intense experience. And I was with other people my age. We were all um, either high school graduates or freshmen in college. And that experience really led me to begin to feel in my heart that, that God was preparing me for something. But I merrily, like, you know, any other 18 year old went off to college and, and quickly forgot about that and, you know, got busy doing college type things, <laughs> <laughs> studying, not studying, <laughs> studying at the last minute, Amen. Amen. you know, making Amen. new friends and Amen. Uh, pledging and all that kind of stuff. But uh, in the summer between my junior and senior year, I was getting really, really anxious. I was going to graduate early because I um, was in a uh, dual program in high school. So I came to college with some college credits already. So I was going to graduate uh, that fall was going to be my last semester. And I was getting really, really anxious about, now, what am I going to do? What am I going to do, mm. you know, with my life? And that summer uh, in, in our uh, region annual conference, we had a leadership training school every year. And although I had a summer job in Nashville, because I was going to Vanderbilt at the time, um, my my parents made arrangements for me to get to leadership training school uh, in Indiana at Indiana Central, which was where they were having it. Uh, and I had an experience there where um, it was kind of funny. Someone came to get me because they said, there's a girl in the chapel and she's crying. And I went, you know, I'm going to be mishelpful. You know, I'm going to go see what this is all about. And she was really, really upset. And I could not figure out what was going on with her. She was crying to the point where she could not articulate. So I just basically started talking to her, you know, kind of putting to work those face sharing skills that I learned about three and a half years earlier. And the more I talked, I started crying myself because I realized much of what I was saying to her, I was really talking to myself. Mm. And uh, that was saying things like, you know, you've got to have faith. You, uh, believing means that you you trust in what you can't see. And and though things don't uh, seem possible right now, things. For, so <laughs> later that day, um, I said something to my bishop at the time, Bishop Elijah Murchison, who in turn turns around and tells the whole conference, Teresa's been called to the ministry. Oh, wow. And, and I'm like, wait, 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 that's not what I said. I didn't say that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I kind of look back at, at that as um, just God's way of saying, you know, you're not going to roll away from this. I've let you have three years of, of uh, you know, your time. Now it's my time. 
For our audio listeners, we pause at this moment for a 1 minute and 33 second paid video sponsorship. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time it is in your time zone. At least on my time, it's it's after church, and I don't know about you, sometimes after church, I'm just lacking energy. Courtney. Yes? Can you get me, can you get me a, uh, one of them vitamins that your mama takes? Here you go, daddy. Let me try one of these. Tastes pretty good. My God, my God, Q! What do you have in there? It's made with vitamins B9 and B12. It's it's great for my overall health. It's made with pectin, a unique fiber in fruit peels. It's simple and delicious. Q, did you know that more people search apple cider vinegar in the U.S. than tea? Google has 15,000 people searching that word every day in the U.S. alone. Kim, how can more people get this gummy? If you want to support the podcast, or if you're looking to improve your health, you can order these gummies at https forward slash forward slash go.goalie.com forward slash becoming discipline. Don't forget to use our promo code becoming disciplined. I graduated, I went back home, taught school, and worked in my local church uh, as a minister, uh, really kind of at that point watching and studying what, you know, being a pastoral leader was all about. And um, eventually, after three years, decided to go to seminary. Our uh, church's general secretary of uh, Christian education at the time, William Johnson, was real instrumental in convincing me that seminary was important. Because every time he would see me at a meeting, he'd say, when are you going to seminary? When are you going to seminary? Because I, I actually started a master of business administration program, an MBA. And, wow. um, you know, he just, I hated to see him coming. And so, um, you know, I, I finally just kind of yielded myself and said, you know, this is, this is what God really wants me to do. And, and I'm okay with that. Part of the issue was, this was 1970. Six, yeah, 1976. I didn't know any women in ministry. I had not seen any women pastors. There were some women who were evangelists. Uh, some we call them exhorters. Um, but in my region, um, there there were actually three of us that started out at the same time uh, on the ordination track. But up until that point, I didn't know what that looked like, and it just you know you it's really difficult to embrace something that you've not seen that you don't have a model for and mm-hmm. that that was my biggest struggle now um and, and sometimes a question deserves a context so that people know where where where's that question coming from mm-hmm. <laughs> so my next couple of questions they come with a context where i have a heart uh john 17 talks about you know the lord's desire for us to to to, to come together in unity and Within the body of Christ, I think we have our different denominations and, you know, sometimes we don't come together as much as we could. And if I ever became a billionaire or when this show takes off and I become the the Puerto Rican (laughs) Oprah Winfrey, uh, then I would like to do what I can to try to bring, you know, try to understand where we're different and where possible, what could we do to come together or understand each other better? So that's the context of these next two questions. Um, What is, you know, as you know, because most of my follow, you know, most of the following of this podcast are Baptist and Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. Uh, What is ordination like for us, for for the CME church? What does that look like? Because I know what it looks like in my tradition, Mm -hmm. but I I just I've I've never seen I've never seen a CME ordination yet. Uh, Well, our ordination is a process and um, you actually began with getting a license from your local church and the local church, you know, where you have been a member at least a year has to affirm, has to affirm you. And then you are recommended to the, the uh, annual conference or the region uh, after you've had a license for at least a year to be what we call admitted on trial. (laughs) Mm It sounds, sounds daunting, doesn't it? But actually it's a trial period. Uh, 
there's a course of study, books that you're supposed to read. Uh, over the years, exams have been added. And uh, as you navigate that process, you know, at various stages, then you get recommended for ordination. So typically you're gonna be a minister on trial for at least two years where you've taken some courses and, um, and passed some tests and you know, kind of demonstrated consistency. And then you're ordained deacon. And once you're ordained deacon, then of course you can um, serve communion, you can uh, baptize in the, you can baptize in the absence, you can serve communion that's been consecrated by an elder. And you know you can function. You're you're then known as reverend after you're ordained deacon. Uh, a lot of our deacons, because we have a shortage of pastors, actually are pastoring. Uh, and but then after you've pastored for at least two years, you can be recommended for elders ordination. So we have a two-step ordination process, and the elders ordination is the final ordination. Sometimes people think you get ordained bishop, but we only consecrate. A bishop. So I am an ordained elder, uh, just like every other uh, elder in the CME church. Amen. And we've all been through that, that same process. Now, uh, within the Baptist community, there's a lot of people who are bivocational. Mm -hmm. Is that does that happen in the CME? Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's um, probably really interestingly, it's probably more common than it used to be. Uh, of course, as uh, economics have changed and you know the value of the dollar and the cost of living has increased most churches have not been able to um, give a commensurate raise to pastors so i would say i've got about 230 some odd pastors i would guess that 80 percent of them are by, by vocation wow. i have very few full-time pastors wow. the ones and, and a few of that 20 percent um, are not full-time pastors, but they don't have to work another job often because they retire from somewhere else and have, you know, other kind of income coming in. But mm -hmm. it, it's, and, and for me as a presiding bishop, it's a little bit problematic because uh, as we know, the workplace has gotten more demanding and less tolerant. I think the culture uh, in the United States has become less appreciative of things religious. Mm -hmm. And so um, where people used to not have a problem getting off from work to come to annual conference for a week, you know, that's an issue for some of our folks. They, they just can't, you know, they have to save their vacation time, which mm -hmm. then means when they need time off to refresh, they don't have it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it comes, um, uh, it becomes a, uh, uh, problematic in a number of ways, not to mention the fact that, you know, if you're working 40, 50, 60 hours a week on a secular job, how much energy do you have Amen. for ministry? Because ministry is uh, generally a fairly intense endeavor. Amen. Especially emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, now, on that same vein of, the, of that question about just understanding the different denominations and understanding each other, uh, for all of us Baptists who drive down the South and we see a CME church, and then we see an AME church. Can you educate all of us uh, once and for all of, of what are the distinctions between the CME and the AME? All right. Well, here's the simple, here's the simple difference. Yes, Timing. Okay. The AME church, as well as the AME Zion church, were founded in the North before the Civil War. And there were both free and uh, enslaved Blacks who had been worshiping white in white Methodist churches, who got up the courage to get up in Philadelphia for the AMEs in New York for the Zions and say, enough, we're starting our own church. That was pre-Civil War. The CME church is the younger of the three, Christian Methodist Episcopal. It was originally colored Methodist Episcopal, founded in 1870. The conversation started in 1866 after emancipation when the white Methodist Church South, Methodist Episcopal Church South said, what shall we do with our colored members? Wow. And at that time, I understand from history that both the AMEs and the AME Zions were vying for uh, our membership. They wanted us to, 
uh, they they literally wanted the Southern Church to bequeath their colored people to them. Wow. Uh, but some of those members said, "We want to start our own church," mm-hmm. and so uh, they gave them resources as well as a timeline, and said, "If you can, you know, establish conferences of at least, you know, in different locations, at least." Uh, I think it was three or four conferences, then you can start your own denomination. In 1870, December 16th, 41 ex-slaves met in Jackson, Tennessee, and wow. founded the, Christ- the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, CME. We changed our name to Christian after the Brown versus uh, Topeka, Kansas Board of Education to, it, to uh, do away with any suggestion that we are a segregated church. We do have some multiracial congregations uh, in our denomination, still predominantly African-American um, historically, but, but uh, we did not want our name to suggest that we were excluding anyone. Mm, good. It's powerful. It's powerful. Now, these, these questions, you just set me up. You, you set me up, man. What is the, so what, uh, with all of that in mind, what is the role of the social justice movement in the church today? What is the role of the social justice movement in the church today? Yes, ma'am. Well, if I may be so bold as to turn your question around, yes, what ma'am. is the church's role Amen. in the social justice movement? Amen. Uh, because I, like I do think there's something about human nature that when pushed or squeezed hard enough, there's this pushback. So I, I really believe that, uh, You know, it kind of if you study your history, the people who are marginalized at some point just kind of get tired of it. And and there's some sort of revolt or rebellion or revolution or something. Uh, It's rarely those that are in power that say, oh, hey, let's give them more rights. (laughs) It happens because of the pushback. So I I would say that the church, uh, particularly the black church, um, has a key role. Now, I I don't like to get into theological debates with people, but I can't help but read the gospel of Jesus Christ as anything but a message of liberation. Amen. He said, I came to you know set free those that are oppressed and to bring liberty. Uh, he was an advocate for the poor. Uh, he went and found the people who were at the margins and the edges of society and, and restored them. Uh, you know, the whole gospel message was was not one of, Uh, ministry to those in power Mm. and so I don't see how the black church could could really theologically justify or any church for that matter any church that claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ how they could justify not being a part of the social justice movement Uh, in my mind the church and social justice go together now interesting enough in the CME church's history one of the <laughs> kind of unspoken conditions of assistance from the Methodist Episcopal Church South was that we not be active in uh, social justice movements. Wow. They they kind of had the expectation. And, and because it was a church in formation uh, without resources, you know, for about three or four decades, that was kind of the identity of the CME church. We focused on education. Uh, You know, the slaves had not, those enslaved people had not been able to learn how to read and write. So we built schools, uh, both elementary and high schools and colleges, some, many of which still exist today. But um, as Jim Crow and particularly during the lynching season, and then most definitely during the 1950s, as civil rights really became a, a hot issue, uh, we became less silent and more active, more engaged. Um, many of our, I'm in Birmingham, and many of the churches here in Birmingham were the CME churches were the only churches that would open their doors mm-hmm. to uh, civil rights meetings and to Martin Luther King uh, and others because we really recognized the importance of the church being involved in social justice. And I, I think that's really important. And if, if we go back to um, your earlier question about integration, that integration in that regard is a, is a bit of an enemy to a robust social justice movement. 
uh, because, you know, um, we have access to so many other places and spaces that it's easy to forget about those that don't. And, um, you know, we have to, I think as a church, remind ourselves of our responsibility for our brothers and sisters and for those who, who are still languishing and still, you know, just without basic needs. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I, uh, I'll probably edit this out because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But uh, I, I pastor a small church and I lost some babies. I lost some of the, the congregants when I became more active in the social justice movement. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, it hurts. But at the same time, I have to be honest to where the, where the Lord's leading me. And uh, and plus, I couldn't um, I was not trying to be partisan, but I could not be quiet from 2016 to 2020 because I felt like, uh, you know, you you don't have to be partisan, but you have to speak when when you see injustice or or wicked things occurring, you know, and Mm -hmm. uh, that's that caused me to lose a few. But Mm -hmm. but uh, I was I was working on a, a, a paper that I'm uh, writing for something else. And a couple of scriptures came to me around this issue. And that's the scripture that says, let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. Amen. In other words, you got to take a stand. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, and then uh, there's that scripture where uh, Jesus likens those who don't to being like lukewarm and he spits, spits us out of the ma- out of his mouth. And I, I think that really applies here to the social justice movement. You just can't be, um, and I think the last four years really showed you, you just can't be neutral. It's Amen. just impossible to be neutral if you're really going to be an advocate for uh, those that Jesus really literally gave his life for. Amen. 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 Now, uh, on Bishop, you just keep you keep you keep setting me up. You keep setting me up for success here. Now, what practices do you engage in to encourage diversity of thought within your circle of influence? OK. Well, when I was working as a chaplain, obviously, uh, the expectation is that you minister to people regardless of their faith. And so although I grew up CME and went to a lot of different uh, schools of different denominations through my chaplaincy work and then later as a chaplain educator, um, my, my whole thinking theologically became an ecumenical process. I'm actually the ecumenical officer for the CME church. Um, currently serve as the vice chair of the board of National Council of Churches and chair of uh, a president of an organization called Churches Uniting in Christ, which is 10 mainline denominations, both black and white denominations that uh, have committed to work together uh, to, to be to represent what it means to live in unity in Christ Jesus. So I, I embrace, you know, this whole notion of um, you know, diversity within the faith. <laughs> I kind of irreverently say, you know, a lot of what we do in the church, we made it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so when you reduce things down to the basic doctrinal beliefs, there are actually very little differences between, uh, particularly in the Christian faith, uh, very few differences between us. It, it's just simply how we choose to express uh, those doctrinal beliefs and how we choose to practice the faith. So in, in my context, um, I really try uh, to give people a voice mm-hmm. to allow people to be heard, uh, to be, give room for people to use their particular gifts mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, just to create a welcoming space. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I engage primarily with the pastors uh, because I expect the pastors to engage with the members of the churches. I do have some contact you know, with laypersons um, for various reasons and when they're serving as officers. But primarily among the pastors, I really do uh, try to listen to, to their perspectives and listen to and be respectful uh, of, um, of them. And, you know, I hope that's how people experience any meeting that I have or any conference that I have. Uh, I really want people to feel free to have an opinion, but I'm also an advocate for your opinion needs to be informed. <laughs> amen. 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 Now, what disciplines are needed for a great ecclesiastical leader and servant? What 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 disciplines do you recommend for a great ecclesiastical leader and servant? 
Well, um, I would say foundational is a, a sense of call. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's easy to kind of assume that that's there. But if you're not kind of intimately engaged with your own call story and your own sense of call, <laughs> you know, that's kind of back. That's kind of your fallback on one of those days when you really don't want to care. Sure. And when you really don't want to go to that meeting and you really when you have that sense of call, it, it, it creates this synergy that really enables you to, to transcend what you would prefer to do as an individual. So I think just this really deep end, and that comes for me through um, meditation, through prayer, through reading. You know, I have a morning ritual that um, every once in a while I, I skip it because I get have to get up a little bit early or something, but, but I always start out the day reading some sort of meditation. I have about three or four different books uh, that I use as meditations. And, um, you know, sometimes I just randomly pick up one. Some days I read from all three of them, but it's just kind of a way of grounding myself. And, and uh, as I read, I try to think about, now, how does this apply to me and my sense of call? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first thing. I, then you got to have a system for keeping up with stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are very few jobs uh, well, I don't want to talk about very few jobs. Let me talk about ministry. There's ministry is not a one, one um, event thing. You've got worship, you've got administration, you've got pastoral care, you've got Christian education, sure. <laughs> you know, you you got evangelism. Then you got the building itself, and then you got finances. So you got to have a way, a system of keeping up with everything. Different mm -hmm. things work for different people. But you got to figure out what works for you. Mm. Uh, the third thing is time management. Figuring out how do I maximize my time. And for me, that means identifying when is the, what, what's my optimum uh, time of functional functionality? What's, what's the time period that I get my best work done? Because that's where I put the most important stuff. Mm. I don't try to do important stuff at the end of the day, because that's when I'm tired and I, I tend not to make good decisions. I don't do um, things that are really in depth early in the morning because I'm a slow, you know, I ease into the day, <laughs> but you got to figure out, you know, how do I use my time? And part of time management also involves boundaries. Mm -hmm. There's got to be some boundaries. You can't work 24 seven. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a starting time and a stopping time. There's got to be time that you set aside to eat right. and to eat right. One of the things I say is if you can eat it out of a bag and you don't need a plate and a fork, it's probably not good for you. Mm. <laughs> um, so you got to have some boundaries. You can't answer the phone all day long. If you're writing, if you're working on a sermon, you, it, it's very, very difficult. I don't, I don't know how anybody really can do a sermon and keep getting interrupted. So you got to set aside time sure. when that phone's not going to be interrupted, interrupting you. And then last is just the physical care. I mentioned uh, eating right, but exercise, uh, I struggle with that one. Sleep, getting enough sleep, getting enough rest. And then the one thing that pastors often leave off is recreation, relaxation. You, we've got, you got to have some downtime where you're, you know, bowling or gardening or uh, riding your bicycle or doing whatever you do that just makes you feel good. Um, because without that self-care, you're going to burn out fairly quickly. You may be productive uh, initially, but the end result of that kind of staying, I literally call it on all the time, you're going to burn out. Amen. Amen. That's good to know. That is good. That is some really good things. Now, I asked this of all my high performers, so it's, it seems a little off, but I mean, you you did reference it there. Um, Bishop, how well do you sleep? Would you consider yourself a good sleeper or, or are you a spotty sleeper or are you a consistent sleeper? How well do you sleep? I'm a consistent sleeper. <laughs> now, my parents would tell you when I was a little girl, I was the first kid that wanted to go to bed. I was ready to go to bed at night. Okay. And of course, then, you know, during my young adult years, I was like, you know, you know, pushing the envelope, staying up all night, you know, doing whatever. 
Yeah. Uh, but, and then I, when I became a parent, my children were born fairly close together. So I tell people I didn't get any sleep for four years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, then I, you know, I am of age where I <laughs> had the menopause, hot flash experience where all kinds of sleep disturbances. But now the key to go to going to going to sleep is to one have a ritual again a, a routine mm-hmm. how do you wind down from the day how do you one of the things i do not do uh i don't check email mm-hmm. after eight o'clock because if i check email and if something's there it's now in my head all night long amen amen and it's and it, it could potentially disturb my sleep and more than likely if it's an email there's nothing i'm gonna do about it until the next day anyway amen so that's kind of one of those boundaries uh, my phone, I turn my phone all on silent mm-hmm. at about nine o'clock. Um, people who need to reach me, you know, my presiding elders have other phone numbers for me. Uh, but, you know, unless it's on fire, what can I do? There's, Amen. You know, part Amen. of it is is not getting so caught up in the ego, thinking that, you know, your presence has to be, you know, there to, for the world to go around. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I learned that the hard way as a parent. Um, when my son first traveled abroad and I was just about to drive myself crazy, worried about it. And I thought, and what what could I do in the U.S.? And he's in Italy if he got sick. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, it's Amen. like. So, um, so I go to bed usually around the same time every night. Uh, but But figuring out how to decompress, how to let go. Uh, I keep list. <laughs> I'm a list keeper because if I can write it down, then I don't have to carry it in my head and in my heart and I can get back to it, you know, during that optimal time of the day for whatever the task is. So I sleep well. I sleep well at night. Um, That's good. My husband is a, he he goes to bed a lot later than I am, light, later than I do. And I'll get up in the morning and he will have, Wash clothes and ran the dishwasher out of here. Any of that? Now, uh, what book outside of the Bible has shaped your life in a in the most profound fashion? Ooh. Wow. Well, there have been several, uh, but the one that there's a book called. Um, Awareness by a, a guy from India, uh, Anthony DeMello, mm. and uh, it's really not it's not it's not a novel. It's kind of a book of meditations of sorts, yeah. but he uses uh, story and philosophy really to make some profound points about the importance of awareness. So I can give you I can give you an example. Um, Part of one of the things that I gained from that book, and this was at a real critical time in my life when I was just doing way too much. um, He talks about um, being attached, detached, attached, but detached. Mm. And, you know, part of his point was that you're most productive when you have an attachment to something, when it's important to you, but you have enough distance from it that you're not invested in the outcome. Mm-hmm. And for me, that 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 really speaks uh, the language of the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and how, you know, to some extent we have to rely on the Holy Spirit and not just on our own devices. So when when a thing I'm, I'm planning or or trying to execute something, if I have in my mind that it's got to turn out like this, not only am I lose, uh, excluding the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, but I'm also creating a win-lose situation mm, that's good. where where at the end if it doesn't turn out like i want it to turn out i'm going to feel bad about it that's good. and so that's so good. uh one of the philosophical theological spiritual points that that i really gained from that was you got to care enough right to be attached to it right but you also have to have enough distance from it that it doesn't destroy you mm. it doesn't turn out like you like you want. And I think that's so important for ministers because so many times we put our uh, our identity as well as our success 
uh, on numbers and figures and, and, you know, check boxes and things. And when you're dealing with humans, you know, anything is possible. Mm. Uh, who just, just look at this pandemic season. Uh, we didn't have, <laughs> this is the real gift of the pandemic. We have learned how to do ministry uh, in a context that we were totally unfamiliar with, and we had no metrics for determining what was successful and what wasn't. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I think you may have changed somebody's life with that. And I think uh, that is what I I can speak for myself. I really needed to hear that right now. That's uh, that's very powerful. I, I think even athletes could learn from that, you know, where you have to care enough about the game, but not be destroyed if you if you miss the last shot. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that's that's mm-hmm. very that's very profound. I can't wait to check that out. Uh, now, what is your favorite passage or book within the Bible? Um, probably second Corinthians where it says we have this treasure in clay jars. Amen. Uh, and then, you know, it goes on to say we're, uh, perplexed, but not destroyed, uh, crushed, but not for say, I can't, I can't quote it verbatim, but I like the, um, the way in which that passage reminds us that no matter how awful something is. There's always that nugget of hopefulness. Mm. Uh, so um, I was just talking to a young lady the other day, and I was reminding her that, um, you know, even at the worst point of your life, she really t- needed to remember that things always change. Mm. You know, the only thing constant in life is is change. So, so part of the walk of faith is the ability to wait for that change. And uh, sometimes it might be a few hours, a few days, a few years, but if you can just kind of maintain that hope that that even when you feel crushed, Amen. you're not going to be destroyed. Even though you, you may feel like you, everybody's abandoned you, uh, God is still with you. Amen. And, and that's the treasure. That's right that we have in Clay John. So that's that's kind of a passage. It, it has real personal meaning for me uh, that really helped me get through a difficult time in my life. Um, you know, when I felt like, boy, this sure isn't working out. Nothing's working out. Amen. And that passage really reminded me of, it was almost like it said, and so what? <laughs> Amen. 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 Keep, keep doing something else. Go do something else. Amen. Amen. Well, that kind of aligns with the awareness book as well. That mm-hmm. passes, they, they both align very nicely. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, at Becoming Discipline, we examine discipline or organization in the following areas. Spirituality, mental discipline, physical discipline, emotional intelligence, financial discipline, time management, home and data organization. Which of these do you consider your strongest points? Which could use some work and how do you plan to strengthen the weak areas in 2021? Wow. Let's see. And, I, um, and, and all of my guests need me to read it again. So let me read it again <laughs> to you. So uh, spirituality, mental discipline, physical discipline, emotional intelligence, financial discipline, time management, home and data organization. Well, I think I alluded earlier that probably exercise as a part of a regular physical discipline is the biggest challenge for me. Um, <laughs> and believe me, I've tried a lot of different stuff, uh, walking. Uh, I was going to the senior center here in my neighborhood before the pandemic. Uh, I've gone to the church up the street to their aerobics class. I mean, it's just Somehow that just seems to elude me, this physical discipline. Now, I think it has something to do with how I grew up. I don't want to give it an excuse, but I've tried to kind of unpack why is this such a challenge for me? Because number one, you know, I grew up a black child who was told, don't sweat your hair out Mm, when you got your hair (laughs) braids. And then, of course, uh, I alluded to the fact that, you know, during the time I grew up, there were many places we couldn't go. I never learned how to swim because we couldn't go to the swimming pool. Mm. Um, so there were just things that, that, that never were a part. So I encourage, uh, really encourage our churches to think more intensely about how we cultivate this physical uh, self-care exercise routine with our children. Because I think from my childhood, uh, that kind of set up a scenario that's really been difficult for me to, to overcome. Amen. Um, 
in terms of what I do well, uh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to say that for last. I'm going to say one more thing. Home. Um, I, I think I'm very, fairly disciplined at home. Although, you know, right now on my bed, there are about, you know, 10 pieces of clothing that I took out over the weekend. I had to travel to a funeral and, you know, I unpacked and didn't hang it up. And you know, I have a habit of not doing that. And I scold myself about it often. So, but then it's, it's my room and it's my house. So who, <laughs> who does it bother? So part of it is, uh, part of the struggle for me is using my own measurement about what is discipline and what is not. Uh, because in my home, I think I'm very disciplined. Trash doesn't stack up. Refrigerator doesn't get gunky and stinky. You know, stuff isn't cluttered in the floor. So I mention that only to say that that it's really, as you establish your own disciplines, it's important that you create your own stand. I don't say create your own standards. You understand the origins of your standards. That's good. That's good. Now, uh, I think I do the mental and spiritual and emotionally fairly well. And that's probably because I'm constantly in conversation with myself. Uh, I may overanalyze sometimes, but I think I'm uh, good at self-monitoring, even when I'm overanalyzing, I say, okay, that's enough. <laughs> you, you've overanalyzed that. And, and that takes, uh, you know, for me, that, that takes a lot of discipline to know when you need to unpack an experience or revisit a conversation or pace yourself around making a, a decision. Uh, Cause sometimes people come at you and they want you to make a decision on their timeline and you have to be uh, spiritually grounded enough, as well as emotionally mature enough to, to follow, literally follow your heart in terms of how you make good decisions. Mm. Uh, so, and I think I do that. I think I do that fairly well. That's been a long process of uh, self-development, meditation, uh, personal therapy, um, lots of reading uh, and, and, and an understanding of the mind and how the mind works and, and everything. So I think I do those. I kind of lump all those together. Amen. Amen. Well, we were three questions left and we're all be, we'll be all done. Well, two really, two questions mm -hmm. left. Are there, uh, Bishop, are there any endeavors, publications and or programs that the CME Church is putting out right now that you would like our audience to be aware of? Uh, well, like everyone else, we've been kind of on a, in a state of pause. We do start uh, on the 30th with our Connectional Youth and Young Adult Conference. Um, I believe registration has closed for that, but that's an event that was supposed to have been in 20, 2020. Yeah. And we moved it and it's on now all virtual. Um, we are in the process as a denomination of moving towards our general conference. And that's when we set the uh, agenda for our next quadrennium, the next four years. So uh, we will be rolling that out. Um, uh, We've actually done some listening tours with that. So that's kind of not really open to the public. But we do have uh, in August, I think it's the last Monday and Tuesday in August, our Unity Summit, which is primarily a Christian uh, education and formation event. Uh, we try to have activities. It's going to be abbreviated, but we do that every every August. Uh, and of course, we are part of several initiatives around vaccines uh, and and trying to help people understand um, what the vaccines are and and the importance of making an informed decision. Mm. So we're involved in that. And now we're starting tonight. Uh, we're part of an organization that's rolling out um, some voter mobilization. So we're we're, we work a lot in partnership with, with other folks, but those are some initiatives that are really important. Uh, the 2024, is that the right year? Yeah, the 2024, ele no, the 2022 midterms yes, next year are critical. Amen. And then, of course, the 2024 elections. And uh, one of the things that uh, these faith groups have uh one of the things that we are doing is to try to not wait until so close to the election, but to really start mobilizing. We've got we've got a, a, a big hill to climb, given some of the state legislation that has passed that have changed the rules around um, early voting and Sunday voting and mail in ballots. And 
part of part of I think part of what I hope we're going to start doing is education, so that people will know what their options are and not be uh, caught unawares, and then unable to vote because they haven't followed the proper steps to do so. So those those are two of the main things that that we're really focused on right now. Now, if our listeners are interested in that and they go to the CME website, will everything be there? Or yeah, yeah, we've got uh, the CME Church dot org, T H E C M E Church dot org, and uh, we've got a um, a section on coronavirus and vaccines. We've got the social justice section. You just click on departments, and um, there's some stuff is on the home page, but you can just navigate through the page and find the kinds of things that we're engaged in and involved in. Amen, Our website amen. is updated almost every day, so it's a it's an active website. There's going to be different information there, you know, as it comes comes out and becomes available. We also amen. have on that page. There's also a listserv where you can sign up to get uh, e blasts, emails, as well as text messages about events and activities. So amen. if anybody's interested in what we're doing and you know want to want to be a part. Uh, just scroll down until you find that part that says sign up and you can sign up and get those, get that information. Amen. Well, Bishop Snorton, we can't thank you enough for coming in. Uh, I tell you what, Bishop, uh, excuse me. I, I, well, I spoke in the future there. I almost called him Bishop Anderson Graves. Reverend Anderson Graves did not, uh, he did not undersell you. You have been amazing and uh, you have been an amazing and gracious guest and you didn't have to do this. You didn't need to do this. We truly appreciate you. You have the last word. And just so you know, your audience, uh, my, you know, my audience here on Becoming Discipline is typically 30 to 55 year olds. I jokingly call them the Get Better Club because they're just they're not all Christian. They're maybe 70 percent Christian, 80 percent Christian. And uh, they're just trying to become a better version of themselves. They're they're pressing for perfection in their own way. Uh, what closing thoughts do you have for our audience? Well, first, Tony, just let me say thank you for this opportunity and for this format. It's been a joy to speak to you and to uh, have my mind <laughs> engaged around uh, this issue of discipline. Uh, to your audience, I would simply say to, to each one of you, don't give up on yourself. Uh, never give up on yourself and don't give up on your dreams. Uh, it's not too late if you need to go back to school, if you need to take a class, if you need to change change jobs and do what you really want to do with your life. Uh, it, it's not too late. Don't be afraid to take that leap of faith. Um, I am a person of faith that I believe that uh, you know God will protect. But even if you, you're not a person of faith, you will never know what your potential is if you never try if you enjoyed Bishop Snorton as much as we did, you can check out her website at cmefifthdistrict.org. That's cmefifthdistrict.org. Thank you so much, and please don't forget, we need you to subscribe.